Hello, my name is Shayna Thorne. I'm here April 4th, 2011 at the Cambridge Narrows Regional Library to interview Robina Weatherly. Our hopes are that you enjoy listening to our interview. Homestead was built in 1816. You were born in this home. When did the family first come to Cambridge now? Uh, they actually came in 1802 as a bride and groom. Mary and Charles Robinson had been married in June of that year. I have found the records. And uh, he had come as a two-year-old child with his father and family as a loyalist in 1783. So he, he he was a loyalist, but a sort of the next generation, in a way. Uh, how did they acquire the land? Uh, the, the land was granted, but the document actually, I have the deed, and it was, or it was called the grant, and it's a great big uh, sealing wax seal on it and, uh, and all handwritten, and it was a block grant and it had names of other families up and down the, the lake. And uh, that was actually done in 1812. So I don't know what the arrangement was, whether people just chose or uh, applied for or what, how, how that worked out. But uh, um, the, the, the grant was, was formalized later, I believe. Who built the homestead? Uh, well, I presume it was Charles, and probably with help from his neighbors by that time, there, there probably were some neighbors, and the the people were, the, the loyalists were skilled people because they had come from settled communities and, uh, or the military, and so they had skills, so they would be able to do all kinds of things. And there may indeed have been a proper carpenter. I don't know. I doubt there was an architect, but I think. What was the homestead built out of? Well, primarily wood for the main structure uh, uh, of stone foundation. And the stones, some of them are very large and quite, quite nicely put together, actually. And they must have been local. 
I, I, I mean, everything would have been local, I presume, except the glass, and uh, that was probably acquired in St. John and brought by, by boat. But this was one of the first house, frame houses built here, so I don't know the details of that. Um, the structure is still very sound. Uh, we recently uh, removed, a, a, to restore and repair, a clapboard or two at the base, and we found some interesting artifacts in, in, in the wall. And also, a few years ago, my mother was doing some renovations and, and repairs, and they found um, pairs of shoes, handmade shoes, in the walls. And we believe it was a tradition to, when you were building a house, to put some of these things in, as uh, whether they were good luck symbols or what, I don't know. But I guess you'd say local materials. The, the floors... Uh, were wide, very wide pine boards. Uh, some of those on the main floor have been uh, replaced, well, I think just put a new floor put over them because pine will wear in time, and uh, hardwood floors over, over that. But upstairs are still the old wide pine boards. And they were, they were called live sawn in that they were laid uh, alternately, in, in that there were a narrow end and a wide end, and then the next one would have the wide end down there, so it all came out right. But they're, they're boards like that. So those were the materials, and there were huge pine trees around here, and that's probably, probably all local. And that summer, 1816, was, uh, according to records, was what they called the year that had no summer. And it's thought that there was a huge uh, volcanic explosion, and it might have been Krakatoa, I'm not sure which one it was, but that obscured the sun to the extent that uh, everything was changed. It was dim and uh, temperatures were different and all kinds of things. So that must have been interesting. Robinsons do for a living? Well, initially, I, I'm sure it was subsistence, and they were very busy, busily occupied building their house and their other buildings and clearing, most importantly, clearing land uh, in order to plant crops. And eventually, as they could, they planted crops, and they were required to, by the grant, terms of the grant, they were required to plant a certain number of acres of this and that. Flax was one of the things that they grew and that would be to make linen because they made their own uh, cloth for clothing and and also they did sell eventually some some uh, woven materials. I, I, there are some records of that. Um, I don't know in what order Think they must have had uh, some cows and some pigs, and you know this, this sort of makes a cycle. And and they'd grow the the food to feed the animals as well as themselves. And as far as that was concerned, they they would have to uh, probably fish for for lots of fish in the lake, and that would be one of the parts of their diet. And so. There's quite a bit of time required to do all those things. And there would have been some hunting too, likely. There were moose and caribou, and that would have been another source of food. And whatever wild berries and so on that there were. All of this takes lots of time, but there were many hands. The first generation, there were eight children. And the next generation, there were eight children. and then a generation of four and a generation of three have been brought up in that house. So, it's all been one family. Parts of the land have, the original grant, have been severed off, but the house and, and what it sits on are all part of the original grant. I understand 
that the Robinsons also owned a mill. Where was the mill located? The mill was located on the north uh, side of the farm uh, on the lake shore, and they must have uh, chosen the location purposely for its characteristics, uh, the fairly deep water out in front. Uh, and they built a, a large mill wharf where they built ships and they were ocean-going ships, so they needed a fair bit of water depth. Uh, there was also, uh, the land had a kind of a brow over which they pushed the logs, so there was a, they could, gravity would take them down, and that was convenient. They would amass the logs on the shore, and, and then, or on this brow, and then they'd be pushed over into the water. Or the logs came by water in rafts, and uh, so the location was probably carefully chosen. When did the Robinsons build the mill? I believe it was built in about 1871. And uh, by this time, this was a common thing in, in the province, that there were uh, quite a few sawmills. There were uh, markets for lumber. Uh, the, the first markets were uh, Britain, uh, at, but, and by that time there was also quite a bit of trade with the United States, the New England states particularly. And the ships from here were able to go down to St. John and down the river and down the coast. To, they used to go to Portland and Boston and so on. And there's a story about one ship uh, that was wrecked, one of the ones that came from here. And there are, that was the Daisy Queen. And there are newspa old newspaper uh, clippings and so on from that. The Robinsons also owned a match factory. When was it built? The match factory, I believe, was probably built a little later than the than the than the mill. It was probably an add-on, and I think they were diversifying and trying to uh, fill market niches. And uh, I I don't know. I remember the building. It it was a two-story building, um, with a built into a hill on the bank of the of the lake, built into a hill. So I remember you entered in big doors from the lower side, or there were doors on the front, the presentation part, <laughs> uh, that were big doors too. And uh, there were several women employed there, as well as some men. Um, and I imagine that they went back and forth from the mill, likely. Uh, I don't know a lot about it, uh, except that it, it operated for quite some time. How profitable it was, I don't know. But they were wooden, wooden matches, and as far as I, I found something that I believe is one of the products, and it was a kind of like a comb. And how that worked, I don't know. Whether they were broken off or how they were sold, I, I don't know that. But it was uh, another industry. Robinsons decided to build the mill and match factory? Well, I, I expect it would fit in with the what was happening in New Brunswick at, the, at that time. There were markets. Uh, this was the heyday of, of uh, lumber being sold. And uh, we transported by ship and so on. So I imagine this was an opportunity. And they... Uh, must have it must have taken quite a bit of capital. I don't know the details of that, but somehow this was this was uh, Charles's son John, who who started this with his two sons, uh, Charles and uh, James. And Charles was the uh, apparently mechanical one and. Uh, who did that sort of thing, and James did the business end of things. 
And uh, so I guess they had a number of people to, to do things in the family. And, uh, and they built the big general store as well. And that was a common practice that the, the people who built a mill would also build a general store. And this was quite a large one, and when I first remember, it had everything. You could just get your needs met. <laughs> it had gone through several hands by that time, but uh, uh, this was a quite a diversified operation, really. Uh, there must have been a market for matches, and there must have been, and there certainly was a market for lumber and the store. And it was the the industry in the community. It uh, it employed uh, a, a, oh probably most of the community. And it must have been quite different from today because it must have been a hive of activity there. And one uh, local person had written a diary that covers that time, and she talked about the the whistle at the mill that signified lunchtime <laughs> or dinner time, as they would have called it. At noon, the, the, the whistle blew at noon. <laughs> so this must have seemed something they set their clocks by. <laughs> so I, I think it was a thriving business for a while anyway. How did the mill fit in with the community? Uh, it must have been very, very important to the community. Uh, most most of the community men were employed there, and and a few women in the match factory, and I don't know about cooks. There might have been the odd woman cook. I don't know that, but uh, often there was a male cook. Uh, I think it must have been extremely important. The mill, the the big store, and the match factory must have. Uh, been most of the business in the, in the area. Uh, it was a, a place for people to sell their lumber and it was a place for people to have employment. And some people must have worked their entire lives there uh, if, because it lasted for 50 years. So a working life was, was probably spent there. And the uh, uh, the sound of the activity must have been quite a different, different from today. <laughs> you know, that must have been a hive of activity in that area. The store wasn't far from, from the mill, and the match factory was lo located on the mill site. So, it certainly must have been a landmark. How did they sell the products they produced in the mill? Uh, I'm not sure of the actual business transactions, whether they sought markets or whether markets came to them. I don't know how that worked. I imagine probably a little of both, and word of mouth, likely. Uh, there were quite a few mills in, in New Brunswick. I imagine that they all shipped to the, the various ports, but mainly St. John, and they would be loaded onto bigger ships. Uh, or the ones these these schooners plied up and down the New England coast, and they would take a cargo of lumber or uh, whatever kind of finished product, and they would often bring back a cargo so they didn't travel light. They bring back a cargo of lime or something like that that was needed for here, and it must have been quite a profitable business at least until the markets, market forces uh, sort of put an end to it and, and, and demand and supply too was, was a factor. <coughs> you could go on cutting the same kind of timber you eventually run out <laughs> so it doesn't grow that fast. Why did the mill shut down? 